What's up, Mushroom Fam? It's Gary with Fresh From The Farm Fungi. I'm here in my lab in Sedalia, Colorado, and today I wanted to talk about the pros and cons of bioprospecting versus in-house breeding for gourmet mushroom farming. And just, I guess, the mushroom industry in general, because it's such an exploding industry, mushroom farming and making textiles out of mushrooms and novel pharmaceutical compounds out of mushrooms. Like there's a lot of interest in breeding mushrooms lately. So I wanted to kind of think about the pros and cons and different strategies for breeding mushrooms and banking genetics in a mushroom farm. So recently, back in the springtime, I came across a inky cat mushroom that I thought was really interesting. It was in my local neighborhood near Denver and I ended up cloning that mushroom out. I picked a few of those inky caps that were growing right along the path and I placed a few of them in some in a brown bag in the fridge and to my surprise it lasted about eight or nine days in the refrigerator before it notoriously um, kind of degraded and turned into a ball of slime. So if anyone has dealt with inky cat mushrooms before, they tend to have a very short shelf life, which that kind of surprised me. They have a beautiful almondy, almost like a sweeter flavor to them, which would make them an ideal mushroom for market. However, usually people will only eat them when they're picked fresh that morning because they degrade so quickly. I had an interest in inky cat mushrooms I decided to clone that variety and now it is running in liquid culture I'm doing some trials on fruiting that is a perfect example of bioprospecting I also recently cloned this uh, puffball mushroom Tim from tip of the cap mushroom recently reached out with a message on Instagram and he was searching for some different uh, puffball species so I found one right down the road from us here in Sedalia in a very dry region it's it was almost like like desert like there was a cactus right nearby and surprisingly my wife was like hey is that a mushroom and I went over to it and it was the most perfect puffball mushroom um, that we found this year so I ended up cloning that out onto some PDA so that's another example of bioprospecting. So bioprospecting is when you find a mushroom in the wild and then you take it back to your laboratory or if you have like a mobile lab, I guess you can do it in the field, but basically you would clone that mushroom and isolate the mycelium for the purposes of production or I guess just um, banking those genetics for the future. So next to me right here, I have another form of mushroom breeding. So this is traditional um, haploid, haploid breeding. I, uh, I started this project back in the springtime and right now I have um, a little over a dozen haploids of Cordyceps militaris, which I will be crossing systematically on agar. So if you haven't seen my video on how to breed Cordyceps, go check that out. It is a very systematic method of breeding mushrooms. So I won't get too deep into that. If you wanna look at the process, go check out that video. However, in comparison to bioprospecting, um, this is kind of the main difference is that you will be able to isolate single spores, systematically cross them together, and then see what the outcome is. Let's go back to the topic of the video which is the pros and cons of bioprospecting versus uh, selective breeding or in-house breeding. One of the main pros of bioprospecting is that there's much less work involved as far as going, as far as cloning the mushroom and doing culture work. Um, it's not as easy as a caveman can do it, but it is fairly simple to clone a mushroom. So you just have to open it up, make sure it's sterile, and get a piece of tissue, and that's it. No streaking out spores, no serial dilutions, no isolating colonies. So the number one pro of bioprospecting, in my opinion, 
is the ease it is to um, replicate that mushroom once you have it in your lab. So another pro, which is pretty um, high up there as well, is that you get to see the final product of the mushroom, um, the final fruiting body, before you go through the work and effort of procuring that new strain. So when you have to um, breed in house, there's not really a way to tell what the final mushroom or the final product is going to look like without running through all the process where if you find this really gorgeous mushroom or this uh, beautiful puffball or inky cap, you can kind of replicate that immediately by just bringing it back to your lab. And then the third pro that I have about bioprospecting over um, in-house breeding is that it does carry some kind of emotion or a legacy when you find that mushroom. So I feel like that's very inspirational to a lot of growers and to the mushroom market. For me in particular, I've collected a few mushrooms from the Telluride Mushroom Festival and then this puffball, which is from my hometown. And then I've got the inky cap from um, Denver. And then I've also collected mushrooms in Puerto Rico and it kind of, is almost like a memorabilia or it gives you a sense of connection to that mushroom where um, if you are just breeding it out in your laboratory it can get pretty mundane doing that even though I've found some really nice strains doing that I would say most of them are just average and they kind of get balled into this uh, this production mushroom or commercial strain compared to a mushroom that you find in the wild that might have more of a connection to you. Now I'll go into the cons of mushroom prospecting or bioprospecting. It can often be difficult or confusing selecting the mycelium when you're bioprospecting. This is a potato dextrose plate and when I clone this puffball there was this uh, yellow tint that started to form. And then as far as the inky cap mushroom, um, it's a pretty standard mycelium, so this isn't too much of a good example. But I know that in the past when I've cloned morel mushrooms, um, they turn an amber color, and that can be very confusing when you're used to seeing uh, pure white colonies that are from like an oyster mushroom, for example. Or another really cool one was when I cloned uh, a bluet mushroom, the mycelium turned magenta almost over time. Some people will get confused with contaminants, but I think that there are hundreds or thousands of clonable and cultivatable mushrooms that when they come from the wild, they're not that typical sterile white mycelium. So that is kind of the number one turn off that people have when they, when they clone a new mushroom. It's really hard to decipher what the mycelium should look like. Creating a resource for what a mycelium should look like might be some value in the future. Anyway, there also is another con is that there could be a high contaminant load when you're bringing that mushroom in from the wild. So. I typically like to clone those mushrooms in a still air box or I'll turn off my flow hood um, just to prevent spores from infesting my lab. That's one thing that you have to be aware of is that there are a lot of potential contaminants when you're bringing a mushroom in from the wild. Another con is that maybe you don't have the proper equipment when you're out in the field. So it could be more difficult to get success when you're cloning a wild mushroom. So you can take spore prints, you can do a, a needle biopsy, which could be a quick solution, or you can have like a little portable still air box with a lab. And uh, every year that I've gone to Telluride Mushroom Festival, I'll turn my little Airbnb bathroom into a mini lab. And that seemed to help um, get me success at least so I can get some tissue on plates and then bring it back to my lab a couple days after the festival. Okay, we talked about the confusing mycelium, the potential for contaminants, the uh, difficulties working in the field with sterile tissue. So also another problem that can arise from bioprospecting is that sometimes you can't get the same replication of tissue because when you clone a mushroom, there's greater chance for senescence or mutations. 
And when you work from Spore, you can always go back to that monoculture. So there's, you know, I guess you could select four uh, mushrooms that don't senesce as quickly, and that would be a way to get around that con, but you'll never be able to go back to the original monocarion because they had already been crossed and are fruiting out in nature. So that's kind of an unfortunate aspect, but with all you know techniques, there's pros and cons, and I just wanted to kind of lay those out. And I guess another, um, another limitation, um, it's, it might not be a con because some people really do like to go out into the woods and travel, but the seasonality and the chance that you will find mushrooms is based on a lot of factors. So the region of the country, the weather in that particular season, just the chance that that mushroom fruited at that very moment, um, it leaves a lot up to chance, but it is very fun to go out and forage and visit new places. So I would just say that's a limitation of bioprospecting. All right, so now I can talk about in-house selective breeding. So some of the pros and cons of that versus the bio prospecting. So once again, I've got a bunch of slants of monocarions of cordyceps. I'm also breeding some hypsozygous variety. And I can talk a little bit about the pros and cons that I like of selective breeding. So the pro, the number one pro is that you can really stretch those genetics to a wide range. Because you're selecting single monocarions, um, you can kind of fish out traits that are recessive that normally would get covered by dominant traits if you were just letting it breed by chance like in nature. So um, by encouraging recessive traits, you can get really cool phenotypes, different colors, different mutations, and that is the number one reason why I like to breed new varieties. Um, it just helps to establish, you know, uh, really specific traits that you're after. And then you can go back to those monocarions and then systematically cross those traits with other mushrooms that you might be interested in bringing that out. There's more control over the end product. Like I said, you can you, once you find a good haploid culture, you can systematically cross that with all sorts of wild mushrooms even, or other commercial strains. So you have more control once you have an understanding of how to do this process. Once again, you can go back to the progenitor cells, which that can help prolong the life of that culture because once you um, fuse the mushrooms, you can only clone them again from there. So. I feel like the senescence problem can arise or there's a higher risk for contamination and then you can't go back and fish those traits out with, without going back to spore. I think that there's a lot of advantages for, for breeding in-house, but now I'm going to talk about some of the cons. It is extremely labor intensive, so it requires a lot of skills. Um, it's much easier just to clone a mushroom than it is to tease out the spores and cross them on auger and get results. So I would say that's kind of the hardest part about breeding mushrooms is just understanding the process and the science behind it. So once again, if you want to take a look at my videos, I kind of dive deep into that. But that is, I would say, the number one reason why people don't breed all of their own mushrooms is it's pretty technical. Also, the cost involved is more because you're going to need to have slants on hand. You're going to need to have an excessive amount of Petri dishes available. A lot of those Petri dishes are going to end up not succeeding. So that's part of the cost is you have to understand that out of a hundred crosses, maybe four or five of those are going to be, you know, ideal. And most of them will just be average. And then a, a small portion of those will be a complete failure. So kind of think about that if you are deciding to get into breeding, that there's a, a huge cost of labor, of materials, and of time. So I guess that's the other major, um, the major drawback to breeding is that you don't even know if you have a successful outcome until the very end. So you have to go through 
the whole entire process. So that's why I like to, you know, breed in these little half pint jars because you're saving yourself a lot of material. So if you can shrink down your process and do your breeding on a small scale, and then you can scale up to larger trials. If you um, are suspicious that you have a really good culture, um, that is what I've been doing and it helps save space and time and effort, but it's still a lot more labor than just going out, picking a mushroom and cloning it. Um, you have to be patient and you have to be really organized in order to backtrack your work to repeat it over time. Okay guys, so give us a thumbs up if you enjoy that breakdown between uh, bioprospecting and breeding mushrooms in-house. Subscribe if you're looking forward to more mycology videos like these. I am going to be releasing these uh, cultures on our Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi. So we have a bunch of fresh liquid cultures available now. I also started doing uh, Petri dishes for those of you who don't like liquid culture. And I'm thinking of more ways to add um, different strains and cultures to our Etsy shop. I'm trying to uh, just build up our library here in Sedalia and I think that the easiest way to distribute our genetics is with liquid culture so that's what we've been doing. Okay guys um, once again give us a thumbs up comment if you have any questions below and until next time much love.